I think a, a good narrator like like yourself definitely brings something to the characters. Um, you know, something more. It, it's easy enough to read through it. It's not easy enough. There's a lot of technical know-how behind it, but you do sometimes get audiobooks that are just a straight read-through. Right. You know, as if someone was just standing on a podium and reading it out. And a good narrator gets past that. They do bring us like a spark of life to characters. Yeah, I like to uh, act them out. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, like... you get that. You can, you can tell. Because obviously, when you've got dialogue written in a book, you, you can have quite, quite quick back and forth between characters. And you know which character is speaking from the way they're written. And in the audio, it's very important that they are all distinct. Yes. You know, as soon as yeah. that narrator opens their mouth, you know which character is speaking. You know who they are. Yeah. Um, and I think you do that very well. Tracy Gregory, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you, Graham. Now, I know you as Peter. So where does Tracy yeah, come from? Classic author name? Uh, kind of. So the name comes from... So it's a pen name, obviously. It's a common yes. name amongst authors. The name comes from a, a contest where a bunch of author friends and I were issued covers at random and how to write a book to match the cover. Yeah. The pen, the pen names were a function of that. To The competition was to see who could do the best with the book with none of their previous recognition behind them. Right. So the name came from that. It came with the cover. It was given to me, essentially. Um, and what was that book then? Uh, that was a book called Aether Knight. What was it called? Aether Knight. And what does that mean? Um, it's a kind of like magical knight. In the book, they're effectively monster hunters. That's what they are. But right. it's a, it was a, it's a different, because it's a different genre from what I write under my own name. I kept the pen name for other books in the same genre. So it's it's like real-time Star Commander. That it's, it's very video game based and... Yeah, um, there are a lot of like video game mechanics and things in it, whereas what I write normally under my own name tends to be more straight science fiction and horror. So I kept the pen name to keep them separate for boring Amazon reasons. You want different pen names for different genres for recommendations and all that kind of thing. And so was this like a writer's group or a, a yes. workshop kind of thing? Right. Yeah, it's basically like a writer's group. Um, a couple of writers from all diff all over the world. Um, we did it just as a bit of fun before Christmas. And I just kept doing names. I just thought obviously do books in my own name, but I just kept doing it under the pen name because it was so well received at the time. And do you recommend that for people who are writers to get involved with other writers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Not just, it's, it could be quite a lonely thing, writing. Yeah. And having other writers that you know, it, it's the same as having work colleagues, isn't it? Effectively, it's... Yeah, people can bounce ideas off or discuss things with, or if you're not sure on something, you can ask them and get their opinions. So it, it definitely, definitely helps. And the book Star Commander, it's a terrific book, by the way. It says it's a it's a game lit novel. What does that mean? Yes. So game lit is a genre of novels that draw inspiration from video games directly, and not just in. A lot of times, they are maybe set in a video game. Um, Real-time right. Star Commander isn't, yeah. but it's about emulating the the trope of the video game itself within within the novel. Yeah. So Real-time Star Commander, everything that happens in that is based on real-time strategy games. You know, your Command and Conquers, your Starcrafts, your Age of Empires, where it is collecting resources and then using those resources to build specific units and then deploying those units onto a battlefield to do whatever you need to do, generally defeat the opponent in some capacity. Um, so you, but you are a, a, you are a gamer then? Yes, so myself, yes. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing it, and I should probably be writing, but I do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is the perfect combination then. It's writing and writing using gaming as the inspiration for the story. Well, yeah, so it's a, it's a very, very up-and-coming genre. Um, it's been about for a couple of years. Um, you, tend to, you tend to see... Not so many strategy games. They tend to generally be role-playing games people tend to use. Um, specifically things like World of Warcraft, you know, EverQuest, Dungeons and Dragons, that kind of thing. They yeah. tend to be the more specific games people use. And you'll see those books referred to online as lit RPGs, literally literature RPGs. Right. Um 
Gamelit is like the umbrella term they're contained within that there are books about like, um, like a friend of mine wrote books that are based on um, Factorial, which is a series of games where you build a factory over time. Uh, another friend of mine did one based on survival games. You know, they're, it, it's very much, it's a very growing genre. There's quite quite a demand for it at the moment. I should say though, that, that for anybody watching this that's thinking about getting the book or the audio book version of it, which I hope, because I narrated it, you don't have to be into gaming or anything. This is a very human story about yeah. a guy who's into something and then his skills at that very specific thing that he's into are used in an incredible way. Do you want to just talk us through the basics of this book? Because it's a terrific story. Yeah. So effectively, um, it focuses on a guy who's very good at strategy games, um, who is essentially abducted by aliens, basically, yeah. who don't have, because of the way their culture is, they don't have that same kind of nuance for strategy that we humans do. You know, we make games about war, books about war, films about war. They don't have that. And so when they get into a fight that they can't win just from being the biggest empire around, they're massively outclassed and have to turn to people humans in order to actually have a chance at winning so it, it is then a book about you're right it's about applying a skill for something it's probably not intended for <laughs> but doing the best you can under the circumstances of it. yeah so evan who's this guy he's um he's not really he's a bit of a loner isn't he really yeah. i think that's fair to yeah, say um, he gets excited about a particular cola that he gets from his corner <laughs> shop. And he's the, there's a kid that is the son of the owner of the shop who also plays the game. He's not so good. He's accidentally abducted yes. at the same time. I mean, Evan is targeted, isn't he, by the aliens yes, because right. they're at war and they need they need a new take on warfare. And because mm -hmm. they and they found this guy who, who's... <laughs> Who, who plays war for fun, which a concept which blows their minds. They can't understand yes. that about humans. Yeah. And so he's abducted and they, they want him to be, or they want the humans, they've got other humans as well, to be um, commanders of fleet, battle fleets. Yes. A, again, against, uh, it's just the best idea for a story. It really is. What's the response been like? Pretty well. I think, I think it's doing pretty good, all things considered. It's, uh, it's got fairly good reviews across the board. Yeah. I tend to find so I'm pretty happy with that. And I mean, I immediately, you know, I'm sure you've seen there's already a, in the ebook, there's already a sequel out, which again has done fairly well. So there was definitely a demand there. People enjoyed it. Yeah. And wanted to see more. So I gave them more. <laughs> That's what they yeah. asked for. Yeah. So the, the, there's, there's two ebooks out, is there? Yes. That's so right, the yes. second one, I'm, as I'm working on the second audio book now, that is the second one in the series. How many that's are you going to go? I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. Is the honest answer? It depends on how many, how long I can keep coming up with, you know, fresh takes and ideas for it. Yeah. Effectively, it's uh, we'll see where we go. I mean, you've you've got the second one. The second one features then kind of ground battles and things like that. It's not just the spaceships. It goes into yeah. I'm about more, halfway more... through the second one now. Yeah, it's yeah. got more of the history of what they're fighting against. What... But they don't really know who the enemy is at the stage. I don't know if it, if, it, if they reveal themselves. Uh, there are robots involved, and they're not really sure if they are the children uh, uh, of mm -hmm. the hegemony, whether that really is them or not. And so there's a bit of a, there's a real mystery to it as well. Who are they fighting and what's their beef? But like they've been fighting forever, but they don't really know why. And so there's all these kind of mysteries to to unravel as well. It's a, it's a, It's a fascinating thing. Where did the main character then, Evan, where did he come from? Evan is just kind of like an amalgam of a lot of different people I know. Um, I do have I do have friends who are very into these kind of like strategy games that it's based on, and he's kind of like an amalgam of all of them. Yeah. Right. He, he is the archetypical, spends all of his time, his free time on one specific thing just to get really good at it. Yeah. But maybe at the detriment to other things as well. Yeah, he, so yeah, a lot of his life, this pretty much is his life, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Every, every waking moment, isn't it? It's what he focuses on. And he's set, it's set in London, it, it's originally set in London, obviously, then it goes out of this world. Um, uh, whereabouts are you? 
I'm in Cardiff, so I'm in South Wales. I'm based in. So why didn't you set him in Cardiff? I like to try and set my so almost all of my in fact, all of my books are have UK protagonists. They tend to, but I try and set them from different places just to be interesting. If they were all from Cardiff, I think it get very samey very quickly. <laughs> I don't know. They make Doctor Who down there, don't they? So you know, it's got pedigree. The problem with making Doctor Who down here is I can watch Doctor Who and they're like, oh, yes, it's an alien spaceship. I'm like, oh, so that's the museum. You really <laughs> right. feel this sense of disbelief when you recognise the, the exact quarry they're filming in. It's a bit I, much. And what about Sandeep? Because I think Sandeep's probably the most interesting character because he was he was abducted by accident. He's He plays Star Commander the game, but he's not at the level of Evan. No. I mean, there, there is a professional level of Star Commander and Evan is just slightly below that. I think um, uh, Sandeep is a couple of levels below that. Is is he based on anybody you know? Not anyone specific, but I, I, I wanted the... I wanted there to be someone in the cast of characters who wasn't good at right. it. Right, okay. Who wasn't a natural at it. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of the story is about how the, the hegemony, the main alien faction, don't grasp the concept behind it. Yeah. Their culture isn't set up for it. And it is to show that, well, actually, maybe he's not the best, but because of the way our society is and our culture is, he's still better at it than these aliens are. He's yes. more of a, a neutral because it's more built into us. Yeah, yeah. And what about then Tolax, the alien? Because I kind of like him because he's, there's an innocence to him that I like. Because um, yeah. he, he really wants to find the answers out and he re they really want to get better at this war thing. And, and the humans always surprise them. Where does his character come from? So I wanted, do you always have, you always have your alien abduction stories, right? Your classics, you know, your greys, your close encounters of the third kind, your, your X-Files, which I've been watching through, because it's on Disney Plus now, <laughs> just going to that. And I always wanted, they're always quite aggressive, right? Aliens, when they abduct you, they yeah. take you out, they do experiments on you, they do all kinds of different things. And I wanted, he's effectively the, the chief scientist, isn't he? I wanted yeah. him to be actually quite a nice guy, not yeah. what you would... Super smart, yeah. Yes, super yeah. smart, but yeah. but yeah, definitely naive because they they all are in the hegemony. They're all quite sheltered. They've gotten by for thousands of years with just being the biggest civilization around, and that's it. Effectively, they are every you know you, the conquering the universe has been easy for them because they don't have to conquer anything. Everyone just joins them because <laughs> why wouldn't they? That's yeah. effectively it. That's, yeah. So yeah, he, he was just. Uh, Kind of an inversion on the standard alien that abducts you does all kind of horrible experiences actually no he's quite nice yeah but also he doesn't also know what he's getting into either really yeah but he's you pushed you, out his comfort zone you you cleverly when you wrote it you, you made sure that you didn't make him typical of hegemony aliens or aliens who belong to no. hegemony because you've got some of the commanders are, are, are quite kind of they're quite bossy and they think they know it and they're not as nice and one of yes. them i don't want to give too much away but one of them meets quite a tragic end so you've actually you've actually there's a there's a bit of perspective there with him as well it's not like the aliens are two-dimensional and then you've got naira as well who's just like She's almost like a, a female Basil Fawlty to me, <laughs> you know. Uh, so the the, the character. How long do you spend then working on the characters when you start putting a book together? I'm, I'm quite. So if you speak to a lot of authors, you'll hear about authors who do you know long outlines and plots, and they spend a long time world building. Um, I'm I'm not like that. I, I will sit down and write the book from start to finish, as it comes to me. Nothing is ever really planned out in advance. So you don't or, know the ending? One or two ideas. No, no, I don't know the ending. The ending is as much as, a, you know, what happens in the book is as much of a surprise to me as it is everybody else. But I I tend to treat it as, as long as I'm enjoying writing the book and I'm enjoying what happens in the book, to me then, well, logically, that will come across and other people will hopefully enjoy it as well. That's the thing. But yeah, yeah I don't. I, I don't, much to the annoyance of a lot of my author friends, I don't plan anything or outline anything in advance. I just have a basic idea or I sit down and then I write it. Well, you, you, you need the characters first though, surely. You, you, you do, you always have a general, so I never like, 
you see a lot of authors that sit down and they go, right, this is this character and they've got this, 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 this. They'll list off what they've got. But I'll have just an idea in my mind as I write them. Like I'll, I'll write the... So I wrote, I write chronologic. I write chapter one to chapter 30, whatever it might be, in order. And when that when I first write that character down, when they first reach that page, they they kind of come fully formed without really thinking about it too much. It One thing, you know, as soon as I write the first lines of dialogue, the toll acts like there, and then I'm deciding what he's like, and his then arc, and who he is, and what he does. Really? So you had you, you had that. no idea what he was like until you actually started writing his dialogue. Yeah, yeah. So he kind so of I, found you. Yeah, it's the same thing. I, I just, and again, like I said, it's very annoying some of the other ones, but I, I will just write them, and however they come across is then right. Well, I can extrapolate then well, this is what they'll do. This is what they're like. This is their personality traits. And they they become kind of more solidified. And obviously, when you go back and edit it, you make changes and things to re-solidify that idea that's built up. Yeah. But yeah, I'll just sit down and do the first draft, and then I, I know who they are then. Yeah. The book's written. How many drafts does it take to do a novel? Um, I I don't do that many. Um, I will do first draft, start the finish of the novel, and then I'll do a, a second draft where I'll go in and I'll change some scenes about it. I'll adjust some characters, make, you know, fill in plot holes, that kind of thing. And then it's effectively then on to, to editing it. And that's it. I I write very quickly. Um, it took me start to finish to write this book and get it finished about two and a half weeks. Wow. Well, it took me, I, longer, um, than, it took me longer than that to narrate it. <laughs> yeah, well, this was the second one's finished. So it was finished now because I, <laughs> time you were narrating it, I'd written it and it was, it was out there in the world. Like I'm... I'm a very quick writer. Um, yeah. I mean, this year alone. So this year alone, I have, including books under my own, my own name, uh, I've released five novellas by the end of this month, uh, three full-length novels, and I'm just about to finish the fourth full-length novel. Over what now. time period again? Uh, this year, so since January. Since January in 2021. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And you're holding down a full time job at the same time. I do a full time job at this day day job at the same time. Yeah. yeah. What's the full time job? Can you write at work? Uh, no, no, I can't write at work. So it is just in the evenings and sometimes in the mornings before I start. That's I, um, an incredible work rate. Wow. Yeah, I'll write on average. I'll write about four or five thousand words a day. Um, sometimes more. That um, is a lot because other authors I've spoken to, their magic figure seems to be a thousand. They. And they, and they seem to, they say they have to do a thousand words a day. So you're doing four or five times that a day and a, and holding down a full-time job. What is the full-time job? Um, I work for a large energy company. Right. Okay. What do you do? I just customer service, nothing major. Well, that, I don't know. There might be a bit of crossover. If you're doing customer service, you're dealing with the general public. You'd be getting dialogue ideas, I would have thought. You, you do. Yeah. <laughs> that is one of, the, one of the downsides of being in lockdown is you do when you're out and about you do tend to pick up dialogue from people but what they say and the things they, they do tends to creep into your work even if yeah. you don't realize it definitely does yeah yeah so did you grow up in cardiff yes i've lived here all my life and what kind of stuff were you reading or were you into when you were a kid where did this all come from i was i was always quite a bookish kid um yeah. i read a lot of um Read a lot of all kinds of novels. You know, you read, you read your Secret Six, you read Blight and all that kind of stuff. My mother used to give me that. Yeah. And then when I reached high school, I started reading um, science fiction fantasy novels. Yeah. Um, I was quite lucky in high school. We had a, so we had a school librarian. Most kids in my school had no interest in reading at all, really. Not re- like a couple of them. Not really. So school librarian, with the budget that she had, would order in books specifically for me to read she would recommend me books that she had ordered in so i would she would she would feed me things like um she'd feed me like stephen king isaac asimov um all of the terry pratchett books she would she would get them in and then have me read them like philip k dick all that kind of thing um i've still got a lot of them in my cupboard with the the library card in the front (laughs) because she would she would always just never take it back if i tried to return them to the library oh that's cool I was quite fortunate that I would always just get fed those. Um, 
but yeah, that that's what it was. I always then just kept going, just kept reading. And um, did you know back then that you wanted to write this stuff as well? Yeah, so I've 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 written since I started reading. I've done writing. Oh, you um, did? So you, yeah, quite, right. So as a kid, you were writing, yeah, making up stuff. Yeah, it, it? yeah. It took me it took me a long time to be comfortable with sharing what I had written. With yeah, other that'd be that'd be quite a That's, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I took so I only started publishing books about, about two years ago. This right, month. right, and it was because uh, I'd always written and I'd always wanted to be an author. You know, and put books out and have people read them. But I never took that step to do it, and I had some kind of kind of personal tragedies in my life at that time where I realised that there was no point not doing it. Yeah, you have to try. If you don't try, you don't put it out there. You never know, and so I literally wrote up a collection of short stories and published it. It's, it seemed to me like the easiest way of ripping that bandaid off was literally write a book and publish it. Short and, stories might have been a good way to go because somebody might not have liked one, but they might have liked a load of the others. Whereas if you yeah. put a novel out first, you're it, you're relying on that one. But short stories yeah. could have been a good scattergun effect. <laughs> yeah, so I, I put that out and that kind of just removed any fear I had of putting. You've done it there. then. Yeah. You've done it. Yeah. You've done it. You've had reviews. You've had feedback. You've seen, you've seen people are willing to pay you money to read your, your stuff. That's a, that's a big boost to the confidence. Absolutely. To really yeah. And so over the last two years, I've just really focused on it. Like anytime I'm not working the day job, it's what, what I'm doing. Yeah. Effectively. So how old were you when you made that step? Because making the step, uh, making the decision I, I to do 30. it. Yeah, it's around about it's around about that age. Something happens to people. There's all those, you know, the stories of the famous rock stars that die at 27. You know, I was I was 30 when I got into radio, which was really hmm. no, I was 27 when I went to radio school, and I was you know 28 or whatever when I started on the air. But around about that. That late 20s, early 30s is when you start going like, no, I've always wanted to do this. I'm going to bloody do it and see what happens. Yeah. 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 You're going to lose at the end of the day. Isn't it, you exactly. Know? There's just something flips in your brain. And, I'd, I, you know, they talk about midlife crisis. And I think, no, I've had mine. That, this is, <laughs> I think they happen <laughs> around about 27 to 32 is about when people go, what do I want out of this journey of life? And what am I going to regret if I, in 20 years' time if I don't do this? Yeah, yeah. so it's interesting. Yeah, it so many people have been through that same experience. Yeah. And it, it's been great. Like, it's the kind of... Nothing is better than, even if it's a small amount of money, nothing is better than being paid for something that you did off your own back. Oh. With your own work it's nobody else taking, nobody else has taken a cut of it except for the amazon man it feels um, criminal at first too doesn't it does a bit yeah i, yeah, I my, my relation is i was i'm going way further back than the first time i got into a, a band that that played paying gigs and we hmm. used to we got booked at this place this is in new zealand it doesn't matter but we've got booked at this place and obviously they didn't pay us but we took i think it was two dollars a person on the door and we were allowed to keep that and at the end of the night we had all this cash because all these people showed up to see us and i'm thinking I've just got that for singing songs I like. That's <laughs> not right. So it's it's the same thing, isn't it? And I went through exactly the same thing when I got into radio and I, I did my first week on the air in Australia at a station. At the end of the, the we paid weekly back then, we got, got paid money for playing records and talking rubbish this is this is amazing so i get how that must feel and and you yeah. you think to yourself why didn't i do this years ago yeah yeah that's the thing you think you, you do think well if i if i started this years ago i'd be in x place by now i'd have <laughs> you know twice well, i like the first few novels it took me months to write the first few novels yeah and it, built up kind of the speed and how quickly I can do it over the last couple of years. Like I'd be a, an unfathomable number right now at this point. It'd be a lot. Yeah. And when you made that decision, when you had that, that book of short stories, who read it first then? Before it was published, you must have had some people you trusted read it. Um, yeah. So some of the, some of the short stories were read by my wife 
first of all. Um, she reads almost everything that yeah, I write. That's good. Um, even, if it, even if it doesn't necessarily interest her. Um, if she doesn't read it, she'll buy the audio book, which is nice. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, um, otherwise, then that's it. Like, it, it kind of, it felt like it would defeat the point if I tried to show it. Like, showing it to the world is the biggest showcase. Yes, it do. is. Yeah. Yeah. No, no feedback is ultimately like reader feedback. You know, they're the people who put down their money at the end of the day for a book that they're going to spend a couple of hours of their, their personal time reading. So, yeah, theirs is what theirs is the opinion that matters. Yeah. I think with a lot of creative things that you do that you have to put out there and, and, and you do put it out there, you, you allow yourself to be vulnerable and to be judged. Mm -hmm. I always think of, I saw an interview with a guy called Danny Bonaducci. Danny Bonaducci, there was an old 70s TV show, I don't remember it, called The Partridge Family. Did you ever see that? Yeah, I have. Yeah. The little kid in that was Danny Partridge. He's, his name's Danny Bonaducci. And he wrote a book called My Life as a Has Been because by the age of like 15, he was washed up in Hollywood and he went through shocking things with drugs and whatever. And he ended up doing stand-up comedy, or for a while he did stand-up comedy. It was while he was a stand-up comedian, I saw him being interviewed in the 80s. And he said, doing comedy is a lot like prostitution. He says, first of all, you start doing it with people you know. Then you start doing it with people you don't know. And then after a while, you go, hey, I should be getting paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's I think that's the same as like music writing or anything is you do you start doing it for people you know then for people you don't know and then you try and then you try and monetize it and it still feels <laughs> slightly dirty but a dirty way of earning a living yeah I do, I do think I think the the kind of advent of the internet as it is at the moment has made it a lot easier for people who are not just writers any kind of artist to, to get paid for what they make you know it's it's a lot easier things like patreon or people doing direct commissions for artists or yeah you know uh, like, uh, uh, audiobook narrators <laughs> yeah exactly yeah exactly i mean like all all of the books that i've published i've i've self-published you know i've not gone through a major publisher i've done it all myself yeah and having that kind of openness to it now means that there's a lot of a lot of brilliant authors out there doing things that maybe the big publishing houses would would never touch yeah because they're looking for some kind of formula or, or yeah 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 or just just the way that it would like like the game lit genre the game lit genre is effectively untouched yeah by the, the big publishing houses yeah but it is a it is a massively growing genre you know it's it's very popular yeah you go on any almost any genre on amazon and you will see in there because there's no official genre on amazon you will see the game and novels in there amongst the best sellers yeah and that's the kind of thing that wouldn't have existed i think without the internet yeah as it is you know, those those people who wanted that kind of thing that demand was out there would would never have found each other yes it's like it's like almost the spirit of punk where yeah you know, it, yeah the big yeah, record labels, you know, the EMIs and the Deckers and the Pies and everything used to control it. And then along came labels like Stiff and then up in Coventry you had Two Tone and, and they brought all this, these these kids who were doing this amazing stuff and, and got it out there. Well, this is even more homemade than that, isn't it? This is actually probably, yeah. for as a music example, going back to Skiffle, which, you know, Skiffle gave us the Beatles. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's just democratised and... And, and and given it to everybody, which means it's now the, the and the, and there's a long tail on these things too. There are people who are into smaller things as a, as consumers have now got the choice to find stuff that appeals to them as well. But yours is actually selling really really well, isn't it? The the, the first Star Commander. I know the I only know the audio book from side of it. You know of the audio books I've done and I've done. I started this. Uh, back in May last year, I wasn't doing audio books till then. I was, I ran a radio station in London and got finished up and had to find some way of earning money from home because we went into lockdown. So I started doing audio books and I've done 48 audio books since then. But yours is the top seller of the ones that I can measure the, uh, the, the sales. Some of them I can't measure the sales because I was paid a straight fee. But the ones yeah. where I get a royalty like your one, I can see yours is by far, it's outselling the others 
it's it's easily selling double the nearest the the near the other one. So yeah, you're doing great because the the market for it is especially yeah. these kind of stories is is really quite quite hungry for it. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, if you, if you post, so if you do your big, you know, your announcements, your Facebook pages, your Reddit, all of that, you know, there's a new book coming out in these genres. One of the first questions you will always see is, when is the audiobook out? Really? Because there's a, yeah, there's a really big audiobook kind of hunger for these kind of stories. Yeah. You know, it, it's quite a, it's a very popular thing um, because it's always it's one of the first questions. When is the audiobook out? Because people want the audio. Yeah, you know, it's a, audio is a growing market anyway. Yeah. So you've got a growing market like audio, and then a you know a growing popular niche. It's the two, it's the two things working in tandem, isn't it? It's the... but it's also a great book too. I want to stress that as well. This is not a niche offering. This is a great story that would make a great movie. You know, of of some guys who who are into games and they get they get abducted by aliens, and the aliens actually, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but the future of the earth is on the line here as well you know yeah. it is just a it's just a ripping story regardless of the genre so just if anybody's thinking oh this is a this is a niche offering who's watching this and thinking oh i don't know about downloading this this uh, no this is a really good story it's just if you like stories it's just a good story too um obviously it's got his fans within the genre so so for you how was the experience because i always worry about this you know You've put all the work into this thing. You've rethought everything. You've worked out the characters. The characters have spoken to you. The story has, has done itself. You've put 4,000 uh, words down every day. And then you have to hand the whole thing totally to someone you've never even met because this is the first time we've even spoken. Yeah. How how was the experience of turning the thing into an audiobook for you? I So I, I've got, not just for yourself, I've got quite a few audiobooks out now with different things. And I find it... I find it quite straightforward. I find the the good narrators make it as easy as possible on that side. Honestly, like you kind of know, as I'm sure you know, you do the auditions, you send the auditions yeah. in, we a whole whack of auditions of people we have to listen through. And you you kind of know when you listen to it who you're gonna pick. You can whip them down quite easily and you you know you can kind of trust them to do it because they're professionals, you know, you're a professional narrator. You've got to trust the professional will do their job as they're supposed to. And I've never had a bad experience. It's always been. Oh, they are great. good. Because I yeah. always wonder from the other side, because we do it through ACX Audio Content Exchange. And I do, I do one audition every day. I get up in the morning and I do an audition. I just look through what's available. I watch one do I fancy. Oh, sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. Because I've done a couple of time travel books and I've done, I've done a nice series of um, two books into a, 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 um, a lady in Florida called Danielle Pai has written some nice sci-fi books. So I saw, oh, sci-fi, oh, I fancy a bit of that. So I just put it in and, and I don't worry about it. And then when I get them, it's like, oh, cool, I've got this one. Yeah, but I just wondered, how many auditions do you get then when you put them in? Um, it, it varies per book. For this one, I had a, about 20. Oh, that's um, quite a lot then to choose from. It's quite a lot, yeah. And so you have to kind of, well, you do get, as with all things like this, you do, you do get different tiers of, ability okay um, obviously you do you know you do there are, there's always a couple of auditions you can quickly go no 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 because the <laughs> the audio quality is maybe recorded not, not on the, the phone <laughs> yeah yeah and, and like i'm sure you know from the, the audition sample i gave because there are a couple of characters in this who aren't well they aren't british they aren't american they're from like norway and korea and that's like, that right kind of yeah yeah and s some of the choices for accents were <laughs> <laughs> unfortunate um, would be honest and so but you do it you, you tend to get down to maybe about your top three or four okay and then it, it takes a little while to kind of decide who you want to want to go with then uh, i'll be honest a lot, a lot of this a lot of this my wife does does she um, good for her because she picked me so yeah. i'm staying well in with her you know what i'm saying but yeah exactly exactly because she also <laughs> obviously you upload the chapters and she will also check them um I, I find it very strange to listen to an audiobook version of my own book. Why? Um, because it's the book is it's in my head. It's my words, right? Yeah. So I wrote the book out and in the head it's in my voice. And then to hear your words in someone else's voice, I find it quite disconcerting sometimes. 
<laughs> okay, I, like, I, I hope that's good. that's okay though. I hope you're not telling is. me you're disappointed. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to record an audiobook because I don't I don't know the first thing about audio quality or dips and peaks or whatever that Amazon want to complain about at the given time. So I you know it, it's important I get the right person to read it through. But it, I do. I, I always find it strange. <laughs> it will always, I think it will always be one of the things to me where it's quite a, it's quite an odd thing. Yeah. Because like I said, it, it's, is there a feeling of the, of the the characters like having a, having another dimension or anything? Or I don't yeah, know. I think I think a, I think a, a good narrator like like yourself definitely brings something to the characters. Um, you know, something more. It, it's easy enough to read through it. It's not easy enough. There's a lot of technical know-how behind it but you do sometimes get audiobooks that are just a straight read through right you know, as if someone's just standing on a podium and reading it out and a good narrator gets past that they do bring us like a spark of life to characters yeah i like uh, to act them out yeah yeah I yeah like... you get that you can you can tell because obviously when you've got dialogue written in a book you, you can have quite a quite quick back and forth between characters and you know which character is speaking from the way they're written. And in the audio, it's very important that they are all distinct. Yes. You know, as soon as yeah. that, that narrator opens their mouth, you know which character is speaking. You know who they are. Yeah. Um, and I think you do that very well. Well, um, I, I work very hard on that. I actually have a, a Google Drive file where when a new character shows up, I read about the character, I read and I read on, see what happens to them, and then I work out a voice for them. And then I, I read the first line of that character in that voice. And then I copy that line and I put it in this, a vo it's called the voices file for each of the books I work. So that when the next time that character comes up, I go back and I listen to me doing the first line I did so that they stay consistent all the way through. Because you can get caught out. I, I did a... Um, it was a time travel book and, and early in the book the the characters went into a coffee shop and they were served a coffee by this this character who didn't even have a name it was just a bloke in a coffee shop and then like near the end of the book they go back in time and go to the coffee shop like half an hour before <laughs> they went there and i had to find the the um the same One character the again and that was about the I think that was about the fourth audio book I did. And I had to go back into the, all of the files and find this bit of audio again. So from <laughs> then on, now, whenever a new character comes up, I've got a file of them. No, no matter how small they are, you know, a hotel receptionist, anything, because they can come back and I've yeah. got to get there yeah. again, you know, and they've got to be absolutely perfect because the author knows exactly how it is. They, you know, because they could be American and then all of a sudden they're a Cockney, you know, do, you know it could literally yeah. be that different. So now I, I do it and, uh, and, it, and it works. It's much easier to work that way. And um, so, yeah, because yours was a bit like that with a few at the beginning. There were a few commanders, the battle scenes and stuff, and there, mm -hmm. were, there were different alien characters and a couple of them did come back later on. So it, it paid off. I think it's the only way to do it for me. If you're going to actually go all the way and do the characters, you've got to be able to find them again if they pop up again. Because you just yeah, never know with a book where the timeline goes. No, and I, th I think I think you're right. I think listeners would notice absolutely. if they were different. They yeah. absolutely would. Yeah, oh, yeah that's, even, that's at the very least, thing. you'd confuse them. And like you said, you it's got to they've got to understand when different people are talking. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm and I'm using a few more little tricks these days, like the robots in the second book. You actually put in there that they spoke with a reverb, so I've actually put reverb on their yeah. voices. And then others who are in, uh, who are talking on radios, or if they're in a spacesuit, talking on an intercom to someone else. I've got an intercom sound effect that I can process the audio so it sounds like they're in, you know, rather than just all being the same. So I don't, I don't know where audio book narration ends and radio drama begins. I think <laughs> yeah. there is, there's definitely a big overlap. I think, yeah, I think you're right. It, it's you do, you are seeing it more and more often. Yeah, um, actually, um, yeah. one of the authors I read, he did as as an audiobook only a radio, a full radio drama, right? Um, that he's now turning into a novel after the fact because it was a, an audible only thing. So I think you're right. I think the the line is becoming more blurred nowadays. Yeah. 
Well, take. I think if you go back as you know to way before audio books were a thing like that. I think we had book on tape, didn't we? But I don't think audio books. Yeah. Audio books are still a relatively new thing with with Audible. If you go back to something that I loved, which was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which yeah. was a radio play. Before it was a TV show, before it was a movie, it was a radio play. And then yeah. I think Douglas Adams wrote the book after he'd done the radio play. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and I loved the book, uh, the first one. I didn't read the other, the restaurant of the inner universe and the life universe and everything, but that first one, I loved the book. So it, it has gone that way before. This is nothing new. <laughs> it's just no. a new, no, just a delivery looking, system. When I was, when I was very young, um, my dad gave me cassettes of the um, the War of the Worlds, the oh, the, mu the musical one. The, when they um, done it as a radio what's, play. What's his name? Jeff fun. Jeff Wayne. Yeah, I've interviewed yeah. Jeff Wayne. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I I spoke to him for about three quarters of an hour. There's, uh, I think it's on YouTube. It was a it was a radio interview. So it was. It was either down the phone or through Skype because it was an anniversary. A few years ago, it was the anniversary of War yeah, of the Worlds. Ago, yeah. And he was talking about how he got Richard Burton and uh, and he was already working with David Essex. He was David Essex's music director for a tour or something. That's how he got David Essex. And he, and he fills in all the blanks. But isn't it wonderful? It's great. When, when I was given it, I was about six, maybe, maybe coming on seven. So it terrified me. Like, oh, did it? You know, I just kept listening to it, though. Because yeah. kids love to be scared, you know they love it. So Richard Burton's especially... terrific in it too, isn't he? Yes, yeah. I think that's something that really holds up. But yeah, I think you're right. It's always been, it's always been a thing, and I think it. People are realizing more now. They've got more access to it. You know, if you yeah, you miss Orson Welles on the radio doing War of the Worlds and scaring everybody off. Yeah, the chances of you catching it again are slim. You know, it, back then it was on the radio once, and that was it. Maybe yeah. got repeated. Yeah. Whereas now your audiobooks you can download them you can grab them you can have them there ready can't you so i think it's exposing more people to that kind of art form which is good it's something you know, i'm very aware of when i'm doing the audiobooks because for years i i did radio and most of the radio i did was live and although the radio station has to legally log the audio for i think it's something like 70 days or something in case somebody complains after that it disappears like forever yeah. it's gone and I'm very aware when I do the audio books is like, you know, if I do a line and I think uh, I could do that better, I always go, no, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do it again because this is here forever. This is, yeah. this is not like radio, whereas like, it's, you know, if this is, if I make a mess of something or mispronounce, you know, something, a place name even, I'll, you know, some of them I'll, I'll be on YouTube looking for bizarre place names in weird country i'm doing one at the moment which is um soldiers in uh, afghanistan and some of the afghan and pakistan place names and names of rivers and stuff i'm having to look them up because i'm thinking if i get this wrong this is there forever so the, you know i'm aware of that the, um, one of the one of the first audio books i ever did was for a horror novel i wrote that set set in wales set in pontypreeth yeah and so there's a lot of welsh place names in it <laughs> Where I had to, like, the narrator had to come to me at certain points, ask how it was like pronounced. And I had to give oh, him an example. Good that he so asked, cool. though. Yeah, 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 yeah. He definitely did. So that was good. But yeah, it. Uh, I definitely get what you mean. It's it's eternal, and once it's on the internet, it's there forever. It's really there forever. Stuff. So you better get it right, uh, yeah. or, or, or you're going to be, you know, you're going to be played on some, you know, have I got news for you or something? that's going to find the bloody thing and is going to make yourself, yeah. <laughs> you know. Okay, so you're working on book two now. What's next for you? How long before you're jacking the, the day job? Um, depends on how many people buy this audiobook. Don't <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't know. Um, it would be a night. It would be nice. And I, I am getting there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I am getting there. But it it's with with writing. A, a lot of people you see a lot on TV. Someone writes a novel, right? They put the novel out, and then they're living the rest of the days in their smoking jacket, yeah, in a filled room behind a desk. And doesn't even if you're published one of the big traditional publishing houses, it just doesn't work like that. It's not. It's about obviously quality matters. You want good books, but it's also a lot about quantity. You want someone to read your book, enjoy it 
and then go buy the others because you only make a few pounds yeah. off a single book sale. Yeah. To make a living off it, you need to sell a lot yeah. of books. Yeah. And most most novels across their lifetime sell less than 100 copies. Yeah. Because there are so many of them. Well, your, you your audio book of Real Time Star Commander sold a lot more than that already. Mm. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's doing yeah, all right. It's doing all right. Doing yeah, all right. It is definitely... But yeah, it's about it's about people want to people do follow authors. They follow, if they like yeah. your work, they will buy yeah. your other work. So having lots not lots of books because you want enough books out that people can explore that backlog. So it take it takes a long time. Yeah, like I said, I'm not I'm not at that point yet, and I've been publishing for for two years. Yeah, that's still very early though, isn't it? I mean, if you look at some it of the, the big names. Um, you know, to use a very old reference, but I don't think Ian Fleming would be a big deal if he only wrote one James Bond book. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It was it's, because it's, it's, of the it's, body it's, of work. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's the long it's the long game, you know, it is building up that body of work that people can enjoy and yeah. in getting that kind of constant stream of sellers. And you will I've got no doubt that I'll get there eventually. That sounds a bit I've no doubt either. The way that this thing is is selling so fast at the beginning, because it's only been on sale. What is it? Week and a half? Two weeks? Yeah, yeah. I mean, about two weeks, I think. And yeah. it's storming. It's already selling double what any of the ones that I can monitor that I've been doing it since May. It's, it's at least double what any of those is selling. And I'm not surprised because it's a like I said, it's a great story. It's called Real Time Star Commander. It's by Tracy Gregory. Now. As a special treat, if you're watching this and you've watched this far, it means you've enjoyed what we've said. I am willing now to give the next 20 people that email me, I will give you a code and you can download Real Time Star Commander for free. I'm, ta I'm literally taking food out of Tracy Gregory's mouth here. He's not, gonna get, he's not going to get any royalties <laughs> off these because I'm going to give them to you for free. All you got to do is in the blurb in the YouTube thing, you'll see my email address. It won't say why. It'll just have my email address. It'll have graham at macmedia.co.uk. You email me and say, hey, can I have one of those? Am I one of the first 20? If you're one of the first 20, I will reply to that email with a code where you can download the book for free. And you don't have to. But if you enjoy it, it'd be nice if you put a nice review on Audible or somewhere where it will help to sell the book as well. But you don't have to do that. Just enjoy the book. Do it for free. So do that now. That's in the blurb down there. My email address, if you haven't got it's Graham, G-R-A-H-M, Graham at macmedia.co.uk. And the, there is a link to that, to that down there. Hey, Tracy Gregory, great to talk to you. And uh, continued you, success. And thanks for choosing me to narrate Real Time Star Commander. I had a blast doing it. I'm really enjoying doing the second one. Second one's about halfway through. So I would say probably within the next six weeks, that one will be for sale. Because I'm, yeah. I'm only a couple of weeks away from, from finishing it. And then it takes whatever ACX decide it takes to, yeah. uh, to yeah. put them out there.